Great, thank you so much, Katrin. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar about a transatlantic perspective on microplastic research and views between the Chesapeake and the Baltic. I'm Dale Medeiros. I'm a senior regional planner for the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, the NVRC. We are a regional council of governments that represents the 13 counties, cities, and towns and 2.5 million people of Northern Virginia. And for decades, NVRC has prioritized the protection and sustainable management of the waters of the Chesapeake. Recently, this has included focusing on the challenges of microplastics. Moreover, as governments of this region look to potentially develop policy responses and programs that address issues such as microplastic monitoring programs, interpreting microplastic pathways, microplastics and wastewater infrastructure, they're going to turn with greater regularity to guidance, information, data um, uh, from the science and research community from this region, but also overseas. So today we're really, really fortunate to have two very distinguished scientists speak about this issue. Dr. Denise Wardrup, a research professor of geography at the Pennsylvania State University and executive director of the Chesapeake Research Consortium, an association of seven research and education institutions around the Chesapeake Bay region. So we'll be joined by Gerald Chernovsky, the head of coastal and marine management group at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemunde, Germany and also a professor at the Department of Ecology and Environmental Sciences at Klepeda University in Lithuania. Drs. Wardrop and Chernovsky will share with us the work of their institutes with microplastic research and the ways that we might collectively begin to explore the possibility of more formal collaboration between the Baltic and the Chesapeake, and in particular ways that might look to support the sustainability agendas of local governments. So why the Baltic? The Chesapeake and the Baltic Sea regions share some ecological and economic parallels that provide the basis for some useful comparative and mutually beneficial research. In addition, countries such as Germany have long pioneered the development and practice of innovative solid waste recycling laws and watershed protection policies from which the Chesapeake Bay region has adopted and might continue to explore adopting. So from this webinar, we look to kickstart conversations about potential future collaboration around shared applied research interests and themes between the two institutions and the two regions. So for example, there might be interest in follow-up discussions, webinars, or even active joint collaboration on themes such as microplastics and wastewater infrastructure. Joint applied research with counterparts from the Baltic on microplastics that might contribute to US MS4 or TMDL programs, or even joint literature reviews around the subject of extended producer responsibility policies as they relate to plastics. Exploring these themes and learning more about the potential for follow-up is just part of the fun of today's webinar. So we invite you to be active and join us in the question and answer session. Thanks again so much to Katrine, her team, and especially to Denise, her team, and Gerald, his team, in the Baltic and also staying up past work hours um, so late in the evening. Denise, please take it away. Uh, thank you. And let me start this. So I'm assuming everyone can see that okay. And um, I'd like to recognize a number of co-authors on this presentation, those who graciously contributed slides and information. And there'll be references throughout the presentation so that you can delve into their work more fully. I'm happy to share the stage with uh, Gerald, uh, the Baltic and the Chesapeake have shared expertise and even researchers have gone back and forth across the pond. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to what may come about from this conversation. The topic itself demands um, some urgency. If the Baltic refers to itself as the big brother of the Chesapeake, um, I will call us the Baltic's little sister. For context, we are a much smaller and shallower ecosystem. Our surface area is 11,600 square kilometers to the Baltic's 370,000. Our average depth is 6.4 meters compared to the Baltic's 57 meters. And so a person who is six feet tall or about two meters could literally wade through a quarter of the Chesapeake and never get his or her hat wet. Um, the Bay and its tidal tributaries have more shoreline than the entire US uh, West Coast. And I will point out a particularly relevant uh, point, which is our land to water ratio in the Chesapeake is 14 to one. That's the largest land to water ratio in the world. And that means that really uh, 
what happens on the land surface um, has a tremendous impact um, on the waterway. While the ecosystems um, may not be quite the same, we do um, share a, a lot of the uh, same challenges. And so we are siblings, so to speak, in those challenges. Um, you can see the land cover over the entire watershed. But I will um, tell you that what's interesting is when you break up the watershed into um, smaller watersheds, you get very, very different um, patterns of land cover. So while, for example, some areas like the Choptank River are 48% agricultural land cover, there will be others like the Patuxent River watershed that are 32% developed land cover. And so in general, um, it's very difficult for a one size fits all approach uh, to reducing pollution um, to work across the region. Let me just provide a little bit of context about um, how I come to the microplastics issue and why I have so many co-authors. Um, established in 1972 and about to celebrate our 50th anniversary, the CRC represents um, seven of the most active research and education institutions um, in the watershed. Uh, really bringing scientists together around a common issue is really what we're about. And um, our main goal is to ensure that the best possible science makes its way into policy and management as quickly as it can. And I would say that we literally have uh, no time to waste. So let me really start the presentation. And, and I wanted to start by noting that conventional wisdom uh, normally sees the European Union endorsing the precautionary principle and proactively regulating uncertain risk while the US um, relatively waits for evidence of harm before uh, regulating. And so this dichotomy is not generally applicable. It does, I think, apply to the issue of microplastics. And so thus, um, when faced with a potential environmental issue of um, uncertain size or unknown size, our management community generally goes through the following questions that you see on the screen. And that's really how I'm gonna structure my presentation today. So the first part is really, how big is the problem? And uh, part A of that question is, is how much is there and, and where is it? And uh, let me just create some definitions and, and in case you're not, or you're new to the issue of microplastics. Um, this is just a definition of the various sizes of plastic, both Gerald and I will be talking about these different sizes, and we're concentrating today on microplastics, which are generally one to less than five millimeters in size. And a good analogy is that the thickness of a credit card is about um, one millimeter. So um, something about the size of the thickness of one to five of your credit cards is the size of the plastic we are looking for. Um, in contrast to the extensive water quality monitoring that's been generated for the Chesapeake Bay since 1985, sampling efforts for microplastics um, are limited, and they're mostly located in the mid and upper um, portions of the bay. And so the issue of microplastics was first brought to light in 2014 by Lance Yankos et al. Um, that's the first reference, who um, sampled four tributaries and um, found that really um, concentrations correlated with population density and the percentage of developer urbanized land use. Um, Bicker, uh, which is the second point you see there, sampled 30 sites along the mid and upper main stem of the Chesapeake Bay and found that actually fragments accounted for over 75% of the sampled microplastics and that concentrations were higher near cities or where large rivers entered the estuary than in the main stem. And finally, uh, Cole sampled numerous creeks and streams in the northeastern US. Seven of those sites were located in the Chesapeake Bay. And he sampled um, both during average and storm flow conditions and found again that creeks and streams had the greatest microplastic concentrations. Given that um, there, were so few observational studies uh, 
And the results actually were not easily compared. Um, the concentrations found across those three studies each differed by each other by an order of magnitude, and so they weren't really comparable. So really to inform a monitoring strategy to find out how big the problem was, um, Alex Lopez and a team of people at Penn State embarked on a modeling study. And um, they combined a hydrodynamic model, Chez Rams, with a Lagrangian particle tracking model called ICFIOP, and uh, made some basic assumptions um, about microplastic um, loading being related to river discharge, took an average year, but basically wanted to answer the following questions. Where do they reside in the bay? Um, where are they going? How long does it take for them to get to their ultimate fate? How do they vary seasonally? And so all of these questions are really have a ecological basis, right? We wanna know where they are and to combine them with um, what we're really concerned about. And so it's, it's the question really is, um, are these estuaries that we're working so hard to restore actually trapping the rivering microplastics or are they just acting as a channel and um, to oceanic transport? So let me um, go here and show you a um, video actually of um, the results of the uh, particle tracking model. And what I want you to notice is um, we were looking at 10 major tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay and uh, the particles are colored according to the tributary that they're coming out of. And what you can see is that they actually not very many make, are making it out of the uh, mouth of the bay. There's quite a bit of variability um, with uh, discharge. And you can see that a lot of them are ending up for some reason over on um, the eastern shore. And so uh, those are sort of major patterns that that come out of it. Then let me, if we look at um, the fate or the potential fate of those, we, we basically um, considered three fates for the microplastic particles. One, that they would be beached. Two, that they would leave the bay. And um, the third is that they would actually stay in the water column. And if you look at uh, the top graph, the black dashed line is the total of all particles. We assumed in the modeling that half the particles were um, positively buoyant, half of them were negatively buoyant. And so, um, for example, for the beached or the green lines, the thin line is actually the sinkers, um, those that are negatively buoyant, and the thick line is the positively buoyant particles. So what you should take away from that green line is that the overwhelming majority of particles are beached within um, the bay. In fact, 90% um, percent and 95% respectively. If you look at the yellow lines, which are what goes out of the bay, what you'll see is that only about 4% actually of the floating particles make it out of the bay and none of the negatively buoyant particles um, leave the bay. That line stays at zero at the bottom. The blue line, which are those that are retained in the water column, it's important to note, I think, when you see the daily stream flow graph at the bottom, that they vary, um, those concentrations vary seasonally. Um, if, again, we look at um, the timings of these situations, um, the floaters are in blue, the sinkers are in red. Um, the gold line is simply neutral buoyancy um, to, to give you a little bit of a, a grounding. You can see that it takes seven to 13 days um, to beach within the bay. That's a relatively short um, time frame. The majority leaves the bay in uh, 26 days. And if you break those apart by source river, which are the bottom graphs, you can see that um, to leave the bay takes 17 to 48 days, depending on the tributary. And to beach is within two to 10 days, except for the Potomac 
which is an outlier, and we think that is really an artifact of the model. So in summary, um, I think what we took away from the modeling study was that over 90% of all the riverine microplastics were trapped within the bay, meaning that the estuary itself is the ultimate fate. Uh, most of those are beached either within their tributaries or along the eastern main stem shore. The majority are beaching by two weeks versus taking up to four weeks to exit the bay. Um, and what's striking about that is actually that the residence time in the Chesapeake Bay is about 180 days. And so um, those that are leaving the bay are leaving more quickly than the average residence time. Um, and the distribution and residence time, we ran a lot of um, model runs and we found that they're sensitive to density, interannual variability and beaching, but not size. Um, so size wasn't a factor in the ultimate fate of the particles. If uh, we look at what we take away from the uh, modeling study to inform our modeling, it basically says to prioritize those tributary shorelines and the eastern main stem, um, and that we might be able to use field studies that look at macroplastics or larger plastics that are easier to see because the sizes might behave the same. And um, the duration of that microplastic uh, exposure to biota is going to depend on that density. In other words, um, if only the floaters are leaving the bay and the sinkers are remaining, what does that mean for biota that may be feeding in different portions? There's a strong seasonal variability in those water column concentrations, which um, speaks to sort of the temporal um, part of monitoring. And we have some strong density driven water column distributions uh, that came up uh, that were found through the modeling. And that can really bias, I think, the information that we get from surface trawls. So part B of the question of, of how big is the problem is, should we be worried? Um, and this slide basically shows you three very iconic species uh, in the Chesapeake Bay which are the striped bass or rockfish, Moroni saxatilis, um, our blue crab, um, Calinecti sapidus, and our underwater grasses. And so what we did was we um, embarked on an ecological risk assessment, and I'll let you know this was done um, by Tetratech and um, under the auspices of, a, of an action team that was formulated in the Bay program that I'll, I'll talk about later. But what is an ecological risk assessment? Basically, it's evaluating how likely it is that um, the microplastics really is posing a problem to something you care very much about. And so it asks you to formulate the problem. Uh, what is it that you're worried about? Um, it talks about what are the exposure pathways? What are the potential effects? And then eventually says, um, how risky is this? So how risky is microplastics to something we're really interested in? And when the ecological risk assessment was done, uh, we decided on uh, the thing we were going to worry about or basically formulate the problem around was what are the impacts on striped bass? And the reason a striped bass was chosen is because it's an apex predator. Um, certainly it encompasses um, a multitude of trophic levels and other species. And so if you assess the risk to the striped bass, you're really including the risk to a whole bunch of things underneath it in the food chain. Uh, there's also been a uh, decline in striped bass abundance um, and it's uh, strongly regulated as a fishery. And so there's a lot of interest in what might be happening to striped bass. In addition, there's a wealth of knowledge on um, the age classes that spend their time in the bay. There's been a lot of work done um, on dietary composition um, and uh, really population assessments. And ultimately, it's an, a very iconic Chesapeake Bay species. And uh, if you look on the web, you'll see thousands of pictures of people with their, their prized striped bass catch. And there's quite a commercial fishery as well.
Uh, we limited the ecological risk assessment to a major tributary, the Potomac River. And uh, really, uh, that was chosen to um, let us limit the uncertainty associated with it because we really wanted to use this ecological risk assessment as a template that we could perhaps move around to the bay. So it does contain the species and habitats that are prevalent throughout the entire bay. Um, it is the second most important nursery for striped bass along the East Coast. And um, we had some very specific information for the Potomac. So for example, feeding strategies of striped bass um, vary by latitude. And so um, it was important to sort of limit um, our study to where we knew there was um, pretty good information on those pathways. So the first point is again, your, your biological endpoint of, of interest. And in it, you can begin to see how complex an ecological risk assessment gets. And so um, you can see that when we look at what we questions we might ask about the striped bass, it would be things that um, fisheries management is based on. So uh, what is mortality? Um, what might be the age structure of the population? What I, um, we concentrated really on um, young of the year striped bass, uh, juveniles and uh, larvae. But what I really want you to kind of look at is um, that prey network will be expanded in the next slide. But I want you to look at um, actually the places in the environment where that microplastics are that, that those prey are feeding on. And just to tell you that it begins to complicate um, what you might monitor for. So for example, um, there are, we have concentrations of microplastics in the water column. And one of our studies, the Bicker study actually said, well, 75% of that is fragments. But um, Murphy et al. did a study in the Potomac in SAV beds and really found out that in that environment, the majority of the microplastics were fibers. Um, and that begins to make a difference in um, what those prey are eating and, and how microplastics is affecting them. So that already there's some complexity. The next thing you do is actually you look at all the potential food web interactions that could lead to microplastic intake. And uh, you begin to understand that, that there are, you know, 14 um, things you might want to know about microplastic concentrations in that are important um, food sources for striped bass. And many of those have at least one trophic transfer. Um, involved in them. In other words, um, striped bass are eating something that feeds on phytoplankton. And so uh, the food web interactions get quite complex. <clears throat> the next thing we actually did was then, how can we take um, dietary studies and all the information we have and begin to look at what are the important food web interactions for striped bass living in different salinity regimes? Um, this is an example, and so we actually take dietary composition, and um, you can see that if you get a line, it means there's a, a significant um, feeding behavior going on, and the thickness of the line really is uh, relative to the percent of the diet that is from that food source, so that you can begin to see uh, where or what food sources might be really, really important in um, trophic transfer of microplastic. And what I want you to look at is that we did this for a variety of sal salinity regimes and it changes based on habitat type. So it's, it's really not quite enough to know only about one pathway, it, it gets quite complicated. And so really what, uh, one of the things that came out of the um, ecological risk assessment was really looking at where would we want to concentrate um, our science on or really what are the important taxa to begin to look at to see if there's some sort of information on microplastic presence or consumption. In addition, um, I wanna talk about um, some other additional research that's taken place across the watershed. 
because it's really looked at additional risk posed by microplastics, not just to striped bass. Since plastics um, degrade very slowly, they remain in the environment on much longer timescales than most organic substrates. And they do provide a novel habitat for colonization by bacterial communities. And um, actually those relationships between plastics and bacteria is, is little understood. And so Amanda Laverty of um, Old Dominion University with her team um, looked at plastics as a substrate for communities of bacteria in estuarine surface waters. And um, they also look for something that's uh, tremendously of interest, right? And they analyzed biofilms on plastic substrates to ascertain the presence and abundance of Vibrio species. If you're not um, familiar with uh, the issue of, of Vibrio bacteria, there's three that are considered to be um, quite dangerous human pathogens. And they're the ones uh, listed there. Vibriosis causes an estimated 80,000 illnesses and 100 deaths in the US every year. Um, people become infected either by consuming raw or undercooked seafood or exposing a wound to seawater. And it's actually, uh, in terms of economic cost of vibriosis, it's in the billions. And so what they found actually was that um, they isolated all three potentially pathogenic species um, from plastics that were found in the estuaries. Um, and so they extend that observation, Vibrios have been found on microplastics in the open ocean. It really extends that concern to coastal regions. Um, and if you have any doubt, and, and I hope you can see this uh, video about really ingestion of, of uh, microplastics, um, this is from Heather Sheffy, again at ODU, and it really shows a coral polyp um, ingesting a microplastic. And so if, if you're not a believer in what's the potential uh, for terrific transfer, this, um, that should do it, um, I think, for you. So put that out. Um, another um, uh, piece of research that I think is quite interesting is extending uh, the impacts up to an ecosystem level. And so research at VIMS has started to elucidate those ecosystem level impacts as well. And so they looked at the impacts of microplastics on sedimentary microbial ecosystems and biogeochemical carbon and nitrogen cycles. Um, specifically denitrification. And so they looked at a range you can see of, of plastics here. And uh, they found that the presence of microplastics really alters um, sediment microbial community composition. And to really show what might be the potential impacts of that, they looked at um, denitrification potential and found that that uh, PUF and PLA amended sediments promoted nitrification and denitrification, while PVC amendment inhibits both processes. Um, those results indicate that nitrogen cycling in sediments can be significantly affected by different microplastics, um, which again serve as, as a substrate for microbial communities. And so um, I think the impacts of plastics on global ecosystems and biogeochemical cycling would merit further um, investigation. So what, what can we do about it or, or how is that going in the Chesapeake? And really, what do we need to know and do we need to know more to influence policy? One of the things I'll talk about is how science is really implemented in the, in the Chesapeake um, Bay program on the top there is is the organizational structure of the of the Bay program and at the bottom across um, you'll see goal implementation teams. The the Chesapeake watershed agreement has a uh, very specific 10 goals and so goal teams are formulated around chasing particular goals and that's really at the bottom of where science feeds in. Um, and you can see underneath there that there's a whole science provisioning ecosystem, I call it, 
uh, whether through the science and technical advisory committee or for various science providers of how science gets injected into the program. But sometimes you have the opportunity to um, inject that science at a higher level. And that's really what is in pink there. The, the Plastics Pollution Action Team was formed in the spring of 2020. Um, it had been recommended by a series of workshop activities that had taken place before it. And um, they are informing the management board, which is kind of the date, I would say almost the daily operations of the Bay program makes decisions about what receives priority or in terms of, of resources and timing. And so uh, again, the, the PPAT was consisted of 36 members from federal agencies, state agencies and academia. It was chaired by Matt Robinson of the DC Department of Energy and Environment and vice chaired by Kelly Summers from EPA Region 3. And I would say EPA Region 3 uh, trash free waters program secured funding in 2019 to allow Tetra Tech to actually um, produce the preliminary conceptual model for the ecological risk assessment, um, a document on uniform size classification and terminology, and finally, a microplastic monitoring and science strategy for the Chesapeake Bay. That science strategy was formulated around four questions that you see at the bottom. So what are the health risks? Uh, what are the sources and pathways and loadings? Uh, what management actions might we take? And what do we need to do to really develop sound policies? So the recommendations are, are pretty pragmatic. Um, the first one certainly was about uh, to design and implement a monitoring program. And um, I will tell you that um, the Chesapeake Bay has an extensive uh, monitoring network already in place. This just shows you two of them. So on the right hand side, you can see the more than 120 non-tidal stations. Um, on the left, you can see the benthic habitat stations, and then uh, there are over 100 tidal monitoring stations as well. And so really working with the existing monitoring programs to figure out um, how we can add uh, microplastics to those monitoring strategies in the most effective ways, um, utilizing actually the results of the ecological risk assessment. So again, uh, we need information at, at a pretty small spatial scale uh, to understand some of these impacts. The second recommendation was really looking at, at um, pathways. So what are the largest sources? Um, I think the Baltic has done much more work in, in that area. We really don't have an idea of that yet. Um, and actually looking at um, these particular exposure pathways that link our goals to um, microplastic pollution. Our third recommendation is actually to look at the infrastructure and resources. So how much does the available analytical uh, capability across the watershed in all sources impact our monitoring strategy? So does the monitoring have to be limited because we don't have the laboratory infrastructure? That's certainly a concern and something we haven't really evaluated yet. And the fourth is, is really to continue the visibility of this action team because it's informing management at a very useful level in the Bay program um, to continue to make uh, this issue visible and to keep forwarding the work. And so I would say uh, the question for me at the end is, will microplastics keep us from meeting our restoration goals? Um, in the uh, Bay Watershed Agreement that all of our uh, states have signed and, and the District of Columbia, we have 10 goals and the partnership's been working very, very hard to achieve those goals. And I think the question of whether microplastics keeps us from meeting those goals is an important one. And I just have you really look at three images on this slide to see what the potential issues are. Um, we regulate in the United States based on designated uses. Designated uses are what the public says we want our water bodies to provide. And so in the upper right-hand corner is that map of what's the designated use for migratory um, spawning and nursery areas. 
if you look in the red of where those areas are and then you look at the bottom to where we had the greatest microplastic concentrations the two maps overlay they almost perfectly align in addition climate change and its impacts in making the water warmer in the vertical profiles in the upper left hand corner you can see that there are times of the years where um, the uh, five milligrams per liter is really the minimum oxygen requirement for striped bass. And you can see that at times of the year, uh, they're going to be limited to the upper six or seven meters of the water column. And so as, as we begin to squeeze that habitat, right, um, from climate change, we're starting to layer all these stressors one on top of the other. Um, and just to finish up, I'd like to um, thank the following um, uh, funding sources actually that that weren't mentioned yet. One is in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences at Penn State, the Dean's Fund for Postdoc Facilitated Innovation through collaboration supported the modeling work by Alex Lopez. And uh, Bill and Corinne Irwin, um, through a family program fund, are willing to support continued conversations around this, this issue. Um, as well as the Chesapeake Research Consortium has a large interest. And so I'm very much looking forward to finding how we can find ways forward um, for collaboration on this issue. And with that, I will stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gerald, you're next. You should see the presentation. Um, welcome from Germany. Compared to the Chesapeake um, area, the Baltic Sea is not only much larger, it's much further north. Gerald, Gerald, oh. I'm not seeing the presentation yet. Now it's coming. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, now I see it myself. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's uh, politically much more complex because it's surrounded by altogether nine states in the north, the Scandinavian countries, Finland and Sweden, in the east, the Baltic states and Russia, and in the south, Germany and Poland. We already heard that there are significant uh, differences between the two uh, systems. The Baltic Sea is much larger, it's deeper, uh, the population is higher, but uh, there are similarities between Chesapeake and uh, the Baltic. And one thing is that both are dominated by their river basins. In the case of the Baltic, it's four times larger than the sea surface. And this means that pollutants and nutrients from land control the sea. We have heavy eutrophication, hypoxia, a loss of species and related uh, problems. And one similarity is the intensive use. So in red, you see areas with a high anthropogenic pressure. In blue, in Scandinavia, the one, the areas with low uh, pressure. And you may be surprised that a major pressure in the south is tourism. Despite being quite north, the water temperature exceeds 20 degrees in summer, and bathing tourism takes place at an intensive level. And this picture is of the intensive use of the Baltic Sea is well reflected in this uh, picture. And this shows the concentrations of microplastics in the sea surface layer. So the spatial microplastic pollution pattern in the sea clearly reflect anthropogenic pressure. So we have a problem with uh, marine litter in the Baltic uh, as well, and how do we deal with it? So the major legal framework in the European Union is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Objective is to ensure a good status of all regional seas in uh, Europe. And the good status is defined by 10 descriptors. And descriptor 10 is 
marine litter and in specifics um, plastics and microplastics. This has uh, created a lot of research in uh, Europe and the results and the law is implemented on a regional sea basis. In the Baltic, it's the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So this is a comprehensive program of measures uh, that try to ensure a healthy marine Baltic Sea environment. So this approach is very comparable to the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. What did we do? It is known from literature that synthetic textiles, tire, so rubber, and city dust contribute to more than 80% to the plastic uh, emissions. And usually these plastics are washed off by rain or enter the seas via sewage, water, so they are water bound and urban areas are dominated. So our approach was to compile the microplastic emission for urban sources in the entire Baltic Sea region, to carry out hydrodynamic uh, model simulations on transport behavior and deposition, similar to what was done in Chesapeake. And then we try to compare it with field data. The first step was the compilation of emissions. So we had a look at all sewage treatment plants altogether above um, 3,000, the black dots. We estimated the amount of sewage water, the cleaning technology, and estimated the emission from each sewage treatment. But the sewage, sewage treatment plants and treated water contributes only about 25% of the entire microplastic emission to the Baltic Sea. 25% of altogether estimated 67 trillion particles per year. Especially in Eastern um, Europe, in Russia, some sewage, is, sewage water is not treated, so uh, it, uh, the water is not connected to sewage treatment plants. And what we had to learn is that a major source of microplastic is sewer overflow. And this combines two aspects. This means rain events that wash off plastics from surfaces in urban areas and in combined sewage um, treatment systems where there's only one pipe system, heavy rains cause an overflow and suddenly um, untreated water enters the sea. The most important areas are for discharge are the rivers. So the Oder and the Vistula River in Poland, because of their large um, catchment area, alone contribute about 6% each to the pollution. And these are now the emission points in the Baltic Sea. And just to give you an indication of the amount, this red dot represents 5 trillion particles entering per year. And this is a lone year entering in the Neva area in St. Petersburg. So what we learn is that large rivers and coastal cities are major emission pathways. But the retention of micro microplastics in rivers is largely unknown. There are still many uncertainties and therefore we did not take this into account in our model simulation. I will not show the video, but this screenshot from the video shows you how plastic emitted to the Baltic Sea behaves in the Baltic Sea. 
and you see that there are kind of blooms and the size and form depend on prevailing wind conditions, on the currents uh, and on the discharge. Let's now go into detail. This is an average picture of microplastics in the Baltic Sea surface layer, in the upper two meters of the Baltic Sea. And we learn two major things. If you have a look at the numbers, it is in the central Baltic, possibly 0.1 particle per cubic meter of water. Close to the coast, it's 100 or even 1,000 times higher. So there are steep gradients. But in general, the microplastic concentrations in the sea and the open sea are relatively low. And already after several months, no accumulation in the sea and the water body takes place anymore. So we have a balance between deposition and uh, emission. We see the strong gradients, and this means because the gradients change with each change in wind and current, that microplastic sampling in the sea is tricky. You need a lot of samples, and this seems not cost effective uh, to us. Where in the sea do we find the plastics? This represents four different basins. You see the water depth and the amount of particles. And to make a long story short, floating and sinking microplastic is accumulated very much near the surface. And similar to what we found or what was observed in Chesapeake, differences in shape and size did play only a minor role. What we later learned from other experiments is that biofilms, so as soon as plastic enters the sea, it's overgrown uh, with organic material, and this changes buoyancy and can uh, cause uh, settling. This was not taken into account by us in our simulations. How long does plastic stays in the Baltic Sea? What is the residence there? We separated it for two different plastic types, PEPP, so polyethylene, the floating one, and PET, hard plastic, with a density uh, above one sinking. But what you see is that the average residence time in the Baltic Sea is only about two weeks, independently of the plastic type. It differs a bit between the season, and this has to do with different wind directions, wind speeds, but uh, depends on discharge con uh, conditions as well. So where does it end up? It would be logic to assume that a lot is accumulated in sediments. And you see that there is plastics on sediments, especially in coastal areas. But if you have a look at the concentrations, they are between 0.01 and let's say one particle per square meter. So again, the microplastic concentrations and sediment surfaces are relatively low. And we, our model suggests that there is no permanent accumulation taking place on the sediments because these sediments are sandy. And these sedi uh, sandy sediments are affected by wave action. And wave is all, waves are always resuspending material and washing it at the end ashore. So we see an accumulation at the shoreline as well. And these orange dots with high accumulation indicate 800 million particles that are washed ashore per meter of the coastline per year, especially 
near large rivers and uh, near large cities. So coasts are the major sinks for microplastics and the accumulation at the coasts take place close to the emission point. This means as a consequence that we should focus our monitoring on beaches, on the flood sand, on tidal zones of beaches. So what can we do against the problem? Should we improve wastewater treatment? Just to remind you, only about 37% of the emissions come from treated water. And we had to learn that even a simple treatment, a very simple sewage treatment plant, keeps back about 85% of plastic. If we assume our common uh, treatment technique, this three-step technique at least, already 95% are kept back. And even with a perfect uh, treatment, we can reduce the total loads by, let's say, 20-25%. So wastewater treatment plants are already efficient trends. And in the Baltic Sea region, it is not cost effective to improve sewage treatment plants um, uh, further, not further than this three step uh, treatment. No, we have to deal with the problem differently. We saw that 62% are coming from sewer overflow, heavy rains. And at the moment, we assume that. 1.5% of the total sewage is untreated and entering the sea. If we would keep this water back and reduce this amount to only 0.5% or 0.3% entering the sea untreated, we would re reduce the overall load reduction by 50%. So in the Baltic, Stormwater and sewer overflows seem to be the major microplastic pathways. So what we should do is we should establish separated sewer system. So treat rainwater separately from sewage water and ensure that heavy rains do not immediately uh, wash off water, but that there are retention units in between storing this stormwater and causing sedimentation. A major question was then, because microplastic analysis is expensive, can meso and macroplastic serve as indicators of plastic? Because this is easy to measure. Our result, no. At least not at coasts, because both microplastics and uh, meso macroplastic have different and sources and different pathways. But these simple methods can give us an insight into the spatial pollution pattern. So some take home messages. Mitigation and load reduction measures should address stormwater and sewer overflow, and especially in coastal urban areas. We need further research on the amount that is kept back in rivers. This is still uncertain. And our recommendation is that microplastic monitoring should very much focus on coasts, on the flood zone, on tidal zones of beaches, especially close to emission sources. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and the results that I did show are mainly from these few uh, publications. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both very, very much. And I love that we're using the little clapping icon. It always helps in a, in a virtual environment. You know, it would be nicer to see you all in person, of course. So um, we have collected a few questions already, and I'm just going to go ahead and go through them.
if I can go back up and find them right away. So the first one I have here in the chat is from Clean Streams um, saying, this is also worrisome. Is anyone tracking the percentage of microplastics from synthetic turf fields and associated PFAS? I guess this is a question for either one of you, whoever wants to start. I don't know, Denise, if you want to start, is anyone tracking that? Do you know? Uh, it's a great question and, and no one that I know, but I, I, I think you raise an important issue is um, that one of the things uh, we should be looking for is what are the worrisome combinations of microplastics with um, something that's on it. And uh, that adds another layer to our monitoring strategy. So, no, I don't know of anyone monitoring that, um, but it's a, a great point. Yeah, do you know if, if that's been monitored? In, oh. No. We'll no, put that on the list then, <laughs> for sure. And I think this goes hand in hand with um, with another question from Matt. Was asking, did you look at emissions from agriculture? How do you monitor? How did you monitor air emission? This is something we tried. So um, we had a systematic look, especially in agricultural areas where um, sewage, so sludge, is uh, and has been used as fertilizer earlier. But altogether. What we learned from our area is that this is uh, a minor source because it's mainly trapped in uh, and on agricultural areas. And then I have one for, for Denise here um, from your presentation before. You distinguish between floaters and sinkers, but microplastic shape play an important role. Now, Gerard, you talked about that a little bit, that it actually doesn't. However, the question is still, I believe that microfibers, which are the most abundant whenever sampling procedures do not collect with nets, are more likely to sink. Is that correct? <laughs> and what, I mean, Gerard, you said it doesn't really make a difference, but Denise, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, again, the shape and size and what really is the difference here, what matters? Uh, well, I can, uh, Gerald might be able to inform that a little bit. I will say that uh, the modeling study that we did did not, uh, really look at shape so much as size and density. And so, um, and similar to Gerald's results, the size wasn't a factor, but density certainly is. So I, I think it's a question of um, what is the composition of things that come as fibers? Uh, you know, what's their density versus, um, you know, what, it, when it's fragments, what are the, the primary types of plastic? So density makes a big difference um size didn't in our study and uh we did not investigate shape yeah and you did it doesn't matter <laughs> we had a look at um shape and size in a theoretical way and of course physics says it should make a difference um but what we learned when we carried out uh, different uh, model uh, simulations was that based on our spatial and temporal resolution of the model, this is of minor uh, relevance. As soon as you go into really small scale and um, uh, spatially small scale investigations, and if you have a look in the in the dimension of centimeters or a few meters, then it uh, will make a uh, will play a role, but not. Um, on these kind of large scale um, approaches. Okay. Catherine, I'd, I'd, if I could just make another point, I, th I think what's really stunning <laughs> about both these studies is that um, I would say that people have been perceiving microplastics as a global problem, as you know, their contribution to the ocean is the problem. And both our studies show that uh, they're having very local impacts. Almost all of them are trapped within our water bodies of, of concern. And so I think that that's a real paradigm shift. Yep, absolutely. I think this, this goes into a, a, um, a statement from Raymond. He said, thanks to both speakers for highly informative presentations. I think it's notable that two completely independent modeling studies came up with similar conclusions regarding where it ends up and that it is uh, very locally. 
Um, that brings me basically also to a question. I mean, we talked about, you know, microfibers from washing machines, for example, and we all have this, this is probably what the, what we commonly or, or most we have in mind when we think about microplastic that it comes from some sort of fiber from our clothing, right? Do you think, um, apart from the policy shifts that we need, and I'm sorry for the dog in the background here, maybe Dale, you should take over in a second when I finish with my question. Um, do you think that there's also a shift necessary in the consumer behavior that we're seeing? I mean, there's policy on the one hand, then there's engineering, Gerard, on the other hand, by, by dividing, you know, where the um, sewer comes from. But is it also a matter of locally informing the consumers differently to then also maybe make a difference on a global scale? Or meso and marco plastic, I would fully agree. This is mainly based on uh, consumer behavior and consumer behavior can affect the emissions. With respect to microplastics, I find it uh, much more uh, uh, difficult because it's simply omnipresent uh, in all things we are using and we hardly can control it easily. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would second that, and I I think it brings up a point where um, I think that although we've shown the impacts at at a smaller scale than global oceanic, we could look at the impacts at a smaller scale too. And so the modeling study that we did that shows that the majority of the plastics are are being held in the tributary itself. We should be able to talk to people about the impact at that scale where they actually change their behavior. And so I, I think that's very true for single use plastics for the macroplastics. Um, but I also agree with with Gerald, the microplastics just because they're so prevalent. I I'm really interested in in um, working with him and, and finding out since we have such a large land to water ratio. And that stormwater runoff would be such a large component to finding out what we could really do about that. Uh, two more questions. Um, Tom Fishwhite, so are you observing changes in proportions of microplastics from cosmetics, cleaning products, or the like as policies and regulations evolve to limit their use? And is this possible? Denise, start with you. Yeah, Tom, I would say uh, that's a great question. I think it's um, it's it's quite a lot of um, analysis to actually look at the composition of the plastic and then to go back to its source. So uh, we're not there yet, certainly in the Chesapeake, to be able to really um, see what are the impacts of those policies to date, just because we don't have the monitoring information at at that scale to make that determination. Yeah. Well, cosmetics is really an issue, and this is something I forgot, frankly speaking. So uh, this is really something where consumer behavior could reduce uh, plastic emissions, because in cosmetics, plastic is not really necessary. It can be replaced by um, um, other um, issues, by other, other things. Mm -hmm. I, I will point out that in the US, um, one of the last things President Obama did was sign the Microbead Free Waters Act, uh, which basically eliminated the use of, of microbeads in cosmetic or wash off products. Um, it wasn't all sources of microbeads. There's still quite a bit used in, in things like uh, removal of paint and things like that, but its use in cosmetics was you know, supposedly banned in the US a few years ago. We've got another question. Um, are there some studies about the presence of fake on the water bodies? What do we, I imagine this evolves from the, the concerns about the use of masks in, in light of the pandemic, either in the Chesapeake or the Baltic? I, I didn't get uh, the question for you. Are there studies that your institutes have done concerning or working with the issue of face masks? Uh, no. No. No for the Chesapeake as well. Great. Um, 
colleague also writes, do you think about stronger elements of extended producer responsibility for these materials, policies that link and reduce the sources of these materials, Chesapeake or Baltic? Gerald, I'll let you go first. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, certainly um, when it comes to cosmetics yeah. uh, for microplastics, their um, producer responsibility um, uh, uh, can really can play a, play a role. And what we all should keep in mind is that if we reduce the amount of meso and macro plastic to the environment, we reduce microplastic as well because um, it is simply degraded in the environment, and uh, much of mesoplastics end, ends up finally as uh, microplastics. Yeah. Terry Buchanan writes, are technologies currently available to stormwater overflow sources of MPs in the Baltic? And are they cost effective, or is there something that requires further development? I think you had a nice girl that addressed this, but maybe worth sharing it, going into it a little bit deeper. Hello, Terry. Yes. Um, well, there are quite many, I think over, over 20 possibilities um, that are used in cities to um, reduce uh, stormwater emissions. This is um, sometimes simply ponds, sometimes uh, green areas. Uh, but there is a bunch of, of other uh, possibilities and they are already uh, tried out, especially because of climate uh, change, because what we are facing are more intensive uh, heavy rains. So it becomes necessary to deal with the amount of uh, increasing amount of water. Denise, is there a segue to the Chesapeake on that, on that topic or not? But yeah, I think um, one of the things that I think we're really interested in in Chesapeake is people are doing so much already to reduce nutrients and sediment. And, and what are the co-benefits to microplastic pollution that those same efforts yield? Um, and so looking at it in the context of is what we're doing already for nutrients and sediment, you know, helpful for microplastic um, reduction as well. Julie Streifenrader writes, do you observe a growing pollution rate and do you anticipate a peak in either watershed? Wow, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> Gerald, go ahead. So uh, we had a look uh, at that and in general, the emission increased with um, increasing use of plastics uh, in general. Uh, in the Baltic, we then observed or have a tendency towards a decrease because um, um, more and more sewage treatment plants were developed and with um, the political changes, especially in Eastern uh, Europe, uh, water treatment became much better, mainly to reduce nutrient uh, loads, but at the same time, uh, plastic uh, emissions were reduced as well. So I think we are behind the peak already, I hope. I would, I would remain hopeful for the Chesapeake as well. I think there's a tremendous amount of effort um, in it going after the TMDL goal in 2025. So again, the same uh, things that we do for nutrients and sediment should be reducing microplastic pollution as well. So I'm, I very do hope that the peak is behind us but I'm, I'm not quite sure. We continue to get 180,000 people entering the watershed every year. And so um, that's a little difficult to comprehend. So we're coming to a close. Last question. We'll finish with Denise and then with Gerald, but uh, it's the same question to the two of you. Um, given what we've shared and the conversations that we've had, what's one theme that strikes you as perhaps uh, the most beneficial in terms of um, some kind of collaborative research with um, the the Baltic and or the Chesapeake, starting with the Chesapeake? Um, I would say, uh, boy, I have a really long list on my paper, but I'll, I'll have to pick one. And I would say that um, I think um, the Baltic has done so much in looking at emission sources and 
the impacts of various management options. Um, I'd love to see that collaborated with the Chesapeake's um, work in ecological risk assessment and, and where that really matters. So to combine um, those two things, I think is an area for, for ripe collaboration. Go. Yes, I, I agree on that. Um, so I would have chosen the emissions uh, as well. But for me, the second topic would be really uh, the retention uh, question. So um, we cannot carry out model simulations for all, for each or every small rivers. We need to find simplified approaches to estimate the retention of plastics in rivers, depending on size, shape, density, but morphometric and hydrodynamic conditions to get a bit more realistic picture of real uh, effects and spatial pattern in the environment. And this could be done easily in a cooperation. Fantastic. So since we're working with German counterparts, um, we have to stick to the timetable. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all so much for volunteering your time. Um, the presentations were incredible. I can't thank you guys enough, especially Katrina and her team. Um, rest assured, for those that are watching, there'll be follow up. Um, stay tuned. We will reach out to you very, very soon. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And you find Dale's contact also in the in the chat in case you have more ideas or more feedback for us, because we will definitely continue the series and definitely continue the discussion. Thank you. Have a fantastic evening and a great afternoon. See you soon. Bye-bye.